I'm Sarah Martin, so I'm a physician at Vanderbilt, and I'd like to thank Dr. Whitman for giving me this opportunity. As he said, I'm the medical director of our outpatient palliative care and also see patients on the inpatient palliative care service. Today, I'm hoping to help you understand more of what palliative care actually is and why it might be helpful to you and or your family. The only disclosure I have is that I'm a consultant for the U.S. Department of Justice, which sounds way more exciting than it actually is. Um, it's not exciting at all. And so the first thing we're going to do, which they had mentioned to people streaming, is we're going to watch a film. So this is about a 15-minute film. This film was something I created in conjunction with some of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, honestly, for this exact purpose. So we use it at my institution to show to patients and families to try and show rather than tell what palliative care is. Um, the film has been shown at Vanderbilt, obviously. It's also been shown, it was selected and shown at the American Documentary Film Festival in Palm Springs, California. And then it was a selection at the Nashville Film Festival. So I'm gonna let you watch Modicum of Joy, um, and then we'll reconvene. That was fine. The warmest times in my youth, the threatening time of my youth, is when I was in the woods and the forests. So that's where, where I return now for songs. I'm not a commercial artist. I don't, I'm not trying to sell things to people. I want to make things that are beautiful for me to look at, my, my wife, my friends. I'd like to leave a, some truth and some beauty. Part of my disease, lung cancer, sent a scouting party up to my brain and it became a discreet one inch sphere, too dark, right behind my right eye. That, that tumor gave me all kinds of fits. Um, I'll tell you, I think it was the most miserable time I've had in my life. Fear, dread, not of death, not of just totally, feelings that were totally unattached to anything that was going on around me. You know, when you look at healthcare right now, we are really good at having someone come to the office, get admitted, deal with the acute issue without actually explaining to patients and families the context of their illness. 
So for example, if you have cancer and you're told you have this lung cancer, what I wanna do is be able to say, okay, this is what's going on with you medically. These are the various pathways, and this is what you're telling me who you are as an individual. So this is what I would recommend based on you and your values and medically what is possible. So for example, if someone tells me that being independent, being um, able to do for themselves and stay at home and live out their life is important, okay? And they don't mind trying chemotherapy, but they don't want to end up in a path where the, the cancer ends up being progressive and they end up in a place where they can't take care of themselves. Our job is to try to tailor the treatment plan based on someone's goals and values. So, Fred, tell me how things have been going since I last saw you. Since the last radiation, I had a lot of emotional upheaval. That's the emotional regulator. And, but I'm getting more energy. I'm printing again, and um, the emotions are better. I'm not as crabby and impatient. I still get impatient, but... So when you were at Gilda's Club and heard about palliative care, yeah. what made you think that was something you might want or need? I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do photography, couldn't do my printing. I just was asleep all the time. So really, what made you think palliative care might help is to help with your pain initially? Well, everything. Sure. I mean, because the pain was undermining mm -hmm. everything else. Everything about what life. you wanted to do. Life. Yeah. Anything I wanted to do other than sleep. Yeah. And he couldn't even do that well. Hi, Amanda. Come on in. Good to see you. Thank you for doing that stuff on the last minute. Oh, well, you know, it's always last minute, isn't it? It is. It? it is always last minute. It's always, can you have this done two hours ago? So come on in. So I have an early birthday present for you. Ooh. These are your medals, finally all hung up again. Oh, yeah. They look better than when they, they sure were do. just all mm. lying in the bottom of the yeah. frame. Mm -hmm. And you can now proudly display them again. So what are those two little things on the top of it? Subsequent awards. Three Purple Hearts. So you got three of them? Wow. That's pretty amazing. What, what other ones are special in here? This one I'm proud of. This is a soldier's medal. Mm -hmm. You get that for heroism to help somebody, not to kill somebody. Oh, but there's a good story behind that one. Yeah. Here, I still haven't framed these pieces of yours, but I thought you might like another look. Yeah, that one really... It's really nice turned relief. out well, hasn't it? Good relief. I know, it's a beauty. Well, these are some of my carbon prints. Matter of fact, this is the majority of my carbon prints. I have about four or five at home. That's it. They're all here. So tell me about some of your favorite ones. Well, they're all favorite in a way because I won't take an image and commit to the time, the effort, and the judgments, the hundreds of judgments you have to make to get to this point on an image that doesn't say something to me in the beginning. These prints, all these prints, are made of carbon. Coal doesn't fade. These will last until somebody sets them on fire. And hopefully, the reason I print them is to give other people an opportunity to hear that visual voice that I heard. So this is a typical print, substandard. It's really hard to see when it's wet, but what you can do is often see bubbles or defects 
I don't see anything obvious but I've seen this photo before and I think it's come out a little bit light it's a little bit too light but other than that it's uh, it looks like it printed pretty well so I have to do it again <laughs> one thing we did was um, Fred smoked cigars you know yeah. and when he was diagnosed yeah. <laughs> I said, if you continue to smoke, I'm going to put your ashes in your cigar box. And he thought that was the funniest thing in the whole world. So he went and rummaged around and he said, I want to go in here. So he gave me a cigar box that he wants his ashes to go in. Right? Double R's. Yeah, double R's. So a little while later, after chemo, his hair fell out, including his moustache. And he's had that since he was 18. And Fred kind of is his moustache, right? So a friend brought over a fake one gave it to Fred where he looks at me and I looked at him and it's like oh yeah on the cigar box it's going to go we we just crack up about that don't we we just thought that was really funny that's my last joke that's his last joke yeah <laughs> <laughs> you and I and your wife have talked about how your life has changed since your diagnosis mm -hmm. in some ways for the better okay. oh yes can you tell me about that I will say, as I look back at my life, and times and people, I cannot remember any time or anyone wherein I've been a better, a good, a, as good a friend as people are children to me now. Even people that I don't know that well. Mm -hmm. It's. Um, it's grace. I'll tell you, horseshoe pitching as a kid, I'm not lying, really prepared me for flinging grenades in Vietnam. <laughs> I was really accurate. But this is the most predictable part of my life ever. You've ever had. Makes total sense. I always find it interesting to think about um, the difference between having a terminal illness and knowing about it versus getting hit by a bus and it's over. You know, Amy always says that when uh, when you're at that stage where somebody's at the towards the end of life, says so that's the last good lesson God teaches you, is to care for somebody. You know, it'd be a pretty amazing world if we cared for each other that way all the time. Yeah. You know, that, that's an interesting concept. I'm still trying to learn this thing about time, that it's always right now. <laughs> I keep wanting to project or look back to the past and that kind of thing, but I'm working on it. It's getting better. So this is the picture you took when you well, went to Osvaldo. Yeah, yeah. And it was at the end of this trip driving back when you first developed symptoms of the cancer in your brain. Yeah. And you're going to go back soon. Yes. Well, they've invited me back. Yeah, that's, that's a plan. Unless I get sick Same. or something. Do you have any worries about going back since that happened last no, time? No, it's boat sick. It's the boat sick. <laughs> it's a little boat. <laughs> Only hope six of us. Enjoy it. It's a beautiful thing. It is. I mean, I think this is probably something that's excited me more than anything I've seen on this beach. Yeah, this whole too. beach because this is so unique and. Yeah, that's a piece of wood. Just yeah, I tell you, I did. I did have to do something. I'm sorry that I did it. 
But this one was uh, here on it, and it was flopping over. I'm sure glad you did, because I, I would have done the same thing. I, At least I didn't I have to. I don't want any naturals telling me that I should have done it. I think a good death is very different for each person. We are uniquely different human beings. We all have different values. It would be silly to think that we all think the same way. And so, you know, what I want to do is try to get a sense of what, what does that mean to you? And, and things that we'll ask is like, what are you worried for? What are you hoping about? Where do you want to be at the time you die? What do you want that to look like? Who do you want to be around? And so by asking people, we give people some control in, you know, in a time in your lives and people don't have a whole lot of control. This trip has been a struggle physically. I've walked more in the last two days than I have in the last two months. Now old injuries are coming back. The stuff that Dr. Martin is giving me to help with the pain, well, if it wasn't for that, I'd just be in the clubhouse making brownies. I don't to make brownies. This much time I can figure it out. Dear people of Gildo's Club, I'm writing this note to accompany a pair of Tibet prayer symbols that I am entrusting to us, the community of Gildo's Club. It is my wish that these symbols be used for their intended purpose at gatherings at the Gildo's Club community and at any other functions where their profound influence can be of service to the higher purposes of the occasions at which these symbols are sounded. I would like my memorial service to be opened and closed with the customary three strikes of these symbols. It is with deep love and gratitude that I offer these, my longest held possessions, to our community of honest, wholesome, and loving people. It's my humble desire that each of us be granted profound peace, grace, dignity, love, humor, and even a modicum of joy in our eventual passings. I thoroughly believe that we have nothing to fear.
So is that what people were expecting from palliative care? Maybe. You feel hopeful? Yeah. Fred's a pretty big character. He exudes a lot of hope. Um, is that sort of what you thought care, palliative care might be like? Working with people, getting to know them and their family, walking with them on a journey? Not really. Some people are shaking their head no. I mean, then, do, do you think that's something that maybe could apply to you and your family? And we're going to talk through some of, the, some of that as we go on. So to help illustrate this further and make this a little more pertinent for you, obviously Fred had lung cancer. I'm going to talk about a patient I've seen that, had, that actually had melanoma. Okay. So David was, is a, was a 62-year-old guy. He had metastatic melanoma. Um, and he was seen in clinic by his surgical oncologist because he had developed a large chest mass and was having associated pain and bleeding from that. Um, we were consulted by the surgical oncologist in clinic to help with pain and support of the family. So in that initial clinic visit, um, I met with him and addressed pain management. We talked about what is palliative care, sort of how am I gonna help you and your family moving forward. And then we just started talking about this concept of planning, sort of have you given any thought to what's important to you? Do we know what's important to you? Do we know what you want from your health care? In that same meeting, I also got to meet his wife, Sharon. Um, and you'll see that this is important in palliative care and in care in general. So David is very clear, Mr. L, that Sharon is the most important thing to him. He worries about her a lot, and she worries about him a lot. Um, Sharon is very worried about how he's going to do with this surgery and how that will sort of change the dynamics of their lives. And he's very worried about how Sharon will manage when he's no longer to, quote, do it all. So their current dynamic is that he pays all the bills, he takes care of all the household stuff, um, most importantly, so Nashville is the big city there where Vanderbilt's located. They live about two hours away. And Sharon does not feel comfortable driving to Vanderbilt. So every appointment, including this one, David has draw driven. So Sharon has never driven in. So she comes and she's present, but she can't drive him. So why were we called, you might be thinking. I mean, he'd met with his surgeon. There's a plan. We're going to resect this chest mass to help with pain and control the bleeding. And then he's going to follow up with his medical oncologist to find out about further treatment options after that. So what, what could we add? What could we, are we adding any value here? Is there any role for palliative care? And if so, when's the right time? When should we be called? And so that brings to the question of really what is palliative care? And I'm going to show you some pictures to show that it's sort of pervasive throughout the media. If you're paying attention, it seems to be coming up more and more. Um, so maybe some of you have seen this book, When Breath Becomes Air. So this was a memoir written by a neurosurgeon at Stanford as he faced his lung cancer. Um, there was also Atul Gawande. This was the big book that actually came out before When Breath Becomes Air called Being Mortal. And this was where... Um, Dr. Gawande really talked about how people need to think more about their care preferences and introducing this idea of a dialogue, more of a dialogue between patients, families, and their care and their health care providers about what is important to you and how do we create a plan that's important to you. There's several movies on Netflix. So there's Extremis. And this has won multiple awards, um, and the critical care physician featured in this film now travels around nationally to speak about palliative care. And then my colleague looked at this and said, who's this dude? But this is B.J. Miller, another big um, palliative care physician. He's written articles for New York Times. He also now has a film on Netflix called Endgame, been interviewed by Oprah sort of trying to change the conversation of what is palliative care and when should we use it. So it's out there. People are talking about it. And here's the standard definitions. These are definitions by two different societies. Both are wordy. 
So palliative care and the medical subspecialty of palliative medicine is specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness. It focuses on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of a serious illness, and the goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. The other definition says that in sort of the same way. But you might read those and think, okay. <laughs> So what does that mean for me, and what does that mean in general? And so when I meet patients and families, I just say, I'm specialized care for patients with a severe illness, and I'm, my whole goal is to help you and your family live your best life possible for as long as possible. That can be whatever that means for you. So for Fred initially, that you saw in the film, that was symptoms. For David initially, that was symptoms. That can be psychosocial things, so if you're having difficulty getting to your appointments or you're having difficulty affording medications, how do we help you navigate that? Or maybe you are the caregiver and you're just having severe caregiver burnout, how do we help you navigate that? So really it's looking to make sure that we're taking the best care of you and your caregiving unit as we can as you face this serious illness. I don't think I have to say it to people in this room that Cancer, much like any serious illness, affects more than the patient. It sort of affects everyone in their circle as they're trying to help that person and live with that as well. So is that different than hospice? I mean, how many people of you how many people in here heard palliative care and thought that was the same as hospice? Yeah. Or thought if someone says palliative care, if my physician mentions that, that that's really code for like hospice and they just didn't want to say hospice. Um, and I get that a lot. So we are different than hospice, and here's some differences. You'll see the last two bullet points on both sides are basically the same. They're both covered by insurance. They're both there to help you improve your quality of life. But palliative care is really for any stage of treatment for anyone with an advanced illness. So I tell everyone, basically, you have to be sick in order to see me, and that's about it. I probably shouldn't say that too much or I'll get way too much business, but that, that is the sort of bar, whereas hospice really is reserved for what you thought it was for end of life. So I definitely have patients in my palliative care clinic that have curative disease, but they're facing a serious illness and they need help with certain aspects of that. So seeing palliative care doesn't mean that you're, quote, terminal, and it doesn't mean that you're at the end of your life. So let's go back to David for a minute. So I met him in early April, now it's May. Um, he's admitted for surgical resection, so his surgical oncologist um, took him to the OR to remove this mass. We were called while he was in the hospital to help address pain management. So the surgeons are excellent at post-operative pain, but wanted some help on what should he go home on, um, since he was on some pain management before he came in. And again, we just talked about sort of where are things going, how are things going for you, um, and plan to see him and follow up in clinic when he saw his medical oncologist. Should be noted, this was a stressful hospitalization for David and for Sharon, and it had nothing to do with the surgery. It's because Sharon could not come. So someone dropped David off for this surgery, and then someone came and picked him up and Sharon couldn't drive and get there in between. So it was stressful for both of them to be away from each other and not know sort of really what was going on. And so part of my role in palliative care also is to help people navigate the healthcare system. I'm a physician, I'm not a patient. I think I'd be a terrible patient, honestly. But part of that is because it's really hard to navigate a healthcare system. Have you, any of you experienced that? I mean, it can just be hard to know where, do, where are my doctors, where am I going, when am I going, who am I seeing, why am I seeing, and it can feel a lot like a maze. And a maze with no instructions. Like, we don't tell you where to enter and we certainly don't tell you how to get out. Um, and you just sort of learn as you go along. And hopefully there are people along the way to help you, but really part of my role is to be that person that helps you, to help you figure out sort of where are the services you need, are there services you haven't accessed that you could really benefit from. And so we're really trying to make your maze a little simpler 
It's still a maze, but we're trying to make it a little simpler. And our whole goal here is to create what we call goals of care. So we're trying to take patient and family preferences and requests. So what's important to you? What do we need to know about you as a person to take the best care of you? And then what are your actual medical treatment options? What do they look like? What are the differences? What are the efficacies? And come up with a plan that is centered around what's important to you. So what will actually work best for you? This is how healthcare is moving in general, hopefully. And that's all important, but what, is there any evidence that any of this makes any difference? Well, there is. Um, so the landmark article was actually really not until 2010, so not that long ago, but Jennifer Temmel and her colleagues at Mass General looked at early palliative care in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and what they found was a little surprising. So they found that if you had early palliative care in your cancer treatment, you scored better related to quality of life, you had fewer depressive symptoms, and you had less aggressive care at the end of life if that was what you were hoping for. But maybe most surprising was that they actually found that median survival was increased. So patients with early palliative care lived about two months longer than patients without. So then they went on to look and see if they could replicate that in other kinds of cancer. So the same physician, Jennifer Temmel, looked at early palliative care in patients with lung and GI cancer, and the primary endpoint was change in quality of life. So they're looking to see if they can make a difference in that quality of life score. They also looked at change in depression, and then if people felt more comfortable to communicate preferences about end-of-life stuff to their oncologist. And they found that for patients with newly diagnosed incurable cancers, early palliative care improved the quality of life and other outcomes. And it did vary a little based on cancer type. So in patients with lung cancer specifically, they had better quality of life and depression store scores when they checked at the intervals that were checked in the study. But it didn't seem to matter much in terms of their ability or need to communicate. For patients with GI cancer, their depression and quality of life scores were the same initially, and then they became better, but it did help them have better communication with their care team about what they needed and wanted. And then another trial, the ENABLE trial, um, was looking at early versus delayed initiation of palliative care. And ENABLE, just so you know, stood for Educate, Nurture, and Advise Before Life Ends. And their primary outcomes here were, again, quality of life, symptom impact, mood, impact on survival, and then resource utilization. And early entry participants, their patient-reported outcomes were not statistically significant, so we didn't see a big difference in their depression scales, um, their mood, but their survival one year after enrollment was better than people that enrolled in palliative care later. So again, we're seeing a little survivor benefit. And then ASCO has made a recommendation as well for involvement of palliative care. So ASCO has said that inpatient and outpatients with advanced cancer should receive dedicated palliative care early in their disease course concurrent with active treatment. So further statement that it is not the same as end of life, that you can have this while you're getting treatment. And the literature would argue should. What this graph is trying to show you is that maybe when you first start palliative care, the intensity isn't very high. So maybe you see me not nearly as often as you see your oncologist and other treating teams. But as your course progresses or if you have any problems, the intensity can increase and then come back down as needed. So let's go back to David. Um, he followed up in clinic and he was doing really well. Um, his pain was well controlled, and I had a joint visit with his oncologist to talk about different treatment options moving forward now that we've gotten through the surgery. And in this visit, we really were focusing a lot on symptoms. And so any of you that are, have been on or on treatment are aware that every treatment has its own sort of symptom profile. 
And what you get often depends on you. As Dr. Whitman said, a lot of the immunotherapy, we just don't know how it will, you'll react or when. But things that are common to cancer in general are fatigue. So we spend a lot of time sort of normalizing fatigue. And what do I mean when I say that? Sort of talking to patients and families about fatigue as a symptom, as an expected symptom. And when I talk to families, I'm often helping them understand. If you think about when you have a really bad cold, or if you've ever had the flu, you just don't have the same energy as when you're well. Well, someone with cancer is sick. There's something in their body that's not supposed to be there. And so they have some level of fatigue all the time. And then any cancer-related therapy, literally all of them, cause some level of fatigue. So there's usually two reasons why people feel more tired, and we just need to figure out how to best manage that so that you can do the things that are important to you. Obviously, pain is one that we focus on quite a bit. You saw that in Fred's film, so he felt like his pain was not well controlled prior to seeing palliative care. And then people worry a lot about appetite. So I'm in the South, and in the South, I think everywhere, food is love. So, but everybody wants to feed you when you're sick, and you may not feel like eating all the time. So it's sort of how do we help you navigate? People are just trying to show you affection and love and caregiving, but how do we also help your appetite so that you maintain what you need to in order to have the best chance with your treatment? Also in this visit, we spent a significant amount of time with Sharon, so I spent a significant amount of time with Sharon. She's very worried about her husband's treatment plan, so she wants to make sure that he has a plan and wants to know what the plan is. Um, at this point in this meeting with the oncologist, they're still waiting on some testing to find out specific treatment options, which is really distressful. I mean, it's hard to come back in and be told that we're, we're just still waiting. We, we, there's something there, but we're waiting to tell you exactly what it is. Also spent a lot of time with her going over her concerns about medication management. So up until this point, remember, David had really done everything for himself. Drives himself to his appointments, does all his medicines. So prior to this, she really never had to think about what he was taking or why he was taking it or when he was taking it. Um, and now she did. So now he was starting to rely on her to help manage some of that. And it was overwhelming for her. Um, to sort of think about being in charge of someone else's medicine. Um, the great thing out of this visit is that their neighbor, who also happened to be their landlord, was also present. So it's important to try and get a sense of people's communities as you're trying to care for someone with a serious illness. And it turns out this person was a big source of support for both David and Sharon. So this is the person that had driven them there that day because David didn't feel well enough to drive and Sharon won't. Um, and he became critical in their care moving forward, so it was key that we had some sort of relationship with him. And why do we care so much about caregivers, and why did I choose donkeys? Um, well, you know, caregivers' families are important. They're important for people. You can't face an illness without some caregiver. It does not go well. Um, and that doesn't have to be a spouse or a sibling. That can be, like in this case, a neighbor and a landlord. But whoever is important to you is important to us as your team because we need to make sure that we're doing things to take care of them as well. And I chose donkeys. Well, they're fiercely protective. I don't know if you knew people use donkeys to protect, like, goats and sheep. I didn't know that. Um, and they are affectionate. They'll bond to humans. And they're stubborn. And I'm using stubborn as not a bad trait here, right? So sometimes when you're a patient or a caregiver, you become your own best advocate. And sometimes that requires a little bit of stubbornness to ensure that you are getting the care that is right for you at the right time. And finally, my husband thought it was really funny to teach my daughter that a donkey was my favorite animal as a nod to my stubbornness. And I'll just take it as a compliment. <laughs> And why do we care so much about caregivers? So we know, we've studied that too. Caregivers are important. That same ENABLE trial. Trial was looking at the effect of early versus delayed palliative care for family caregivers of patients with advanced, caregiver, with advanced cancer. 
And early group caregivers had lower depression scores at three months and lower depression and stress burden in the terminal decline analysis. So having another supportive care model around you helped not only the patient, but helped the family and the caregivers as they're trying to cope with their loved one having a serious illness. So the recommendation from that study was that palliative care for caregivers should also be, be initiated as early as possible to try and maximize the benefits. So the case conclusion, um, David was admitted several months later, unfortunately, to a local hospital with confusion and was transferred to Vanderbilt because that's where all of his physicians were. And he was diagnosed with new brain metastasis. And we had a joint meeting, again, with his oncologist and myself and his wife and his landlord. Um, and the decision was made at that time to transition to comfort care because the oncologist did not feel like any further treatments for him at this stage would be appropriate. Um, we spent a lot of time providing support to his wife, so as you can imagine, this was stressful as it would be for anyone, particularly so for her because, again, he's at Vanderbilt, which is two hours from where they live, and she doesn't drive. So it was hard to be away from him, and it was hard to get there. And then she, when she was there, she was constantly stressed about how she was going to get back home. Um, so ultimately, we created a plan that really worked for her, and by working for her, worked for her husband. So we moved him much closer to home, because that was important for her, because she could not keep traveling to Vanderbilt. And with her, made the decision not to bring him back to home. He actually went into an inpatient hospice facility because his care needs were too much for her. And he had been clear that he did not want her to have that burden at that time. So in summary, and I'm finishing a little early, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> palliative care is a medical specialty to help people with serious illnesses to try and live their best life possible. We focus on caring for the patient and the family, and I hope this case and the film illustrated how important both of those are in the sort of the care that we're providing. We are different from hospice. If you take nothing from this talk, take that we're different from hospice. So if your physician ever mentions it, it does not mean that you're dying. And something that really could be right for you. It could be right for you, it could be right for your family, and it could help you face your illness in a new way. I appreciate the time and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.